What up, what up? Wimbush here, and today I'm excited to show you guys how to make this. Now I'm going to show you guys the technique that I'm usually doing whenever I get asked to work on movie trailers. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so to get started off, I'm in Cinema 4D version R21, and I'm going to get kicked off by changing my frame rate here and my attributes window. I'm going to be working at 24 frames per second. And if you don't have your attributes window here, all you have to do is go over to edit, come down to project settings, and that will bring this up for you. And so you want to make sure that you set your frame rate here and you want to set it inside your render settings as well. So if I come under output, I'm going to come under presets and I'm just going to make this uh, HD TV at 24. So come under film video down to this one here. So now you can see our frame rate is 24 here and our project setting is 24. So anytime you start a Cinema 4D project, you wanna make sure your frame rate is set in both places so that it doesn't get messed up whenever you render your stuff out. And so since I have this render setting window open, I'm gonna go on renders and I'm gonna click on Redshift since that's what I'm rendering with. Then I'm gonna click on Redshift again here and I'm gonna turn off my forest enabled IPR and then I'm gonna leave everything else at default. We'll work on this stuff later, but first I'm gonna start working on my scene. And so I'm gonna start off by making a redshift camera. And if I click on my camera and come under coordinates, I'm just gonna zero everything out like so. So now our camera is in direct center of our scene. Then I'm also gonna add some MoGraph text. So I'm gonna go over MoGraph, come down to Mo text, and then I have my text here. So first I'm gonna click on my object. I'm just gonna type in Windbush, and then I'm gonna add a little bit of depth here as well. So instead of 20 centimeters, maybe extend it out to like 30, just add a little bit there. And then for my alignment, I'm gonna make it middle, like so. And then for my font, I'm gonna use with Trojan Pro. Yeah, like that. And so I like using Trojan Pro, especially for like epic cinematic trailers that I work on and stuff like that. The clients usually like this font, and so I'm gonna use that here. And plus this gives us a pretty good chisel whenever we chisel this out. And so I think we're good there. So I'm gonna come over to caps. Let me zoom in on one of the letters here. And so I'm on a caps option here. I'm gonna turn off end cap, cause I don't need it. And I'm gonna leave start cap check marked here. And then under bevel shape, I'm gonna leave it on round, but under size, if you drag it over to the right, you can see that we're easily chiseling the text. So maybe about 15 centimeters, and that gives us a nice chisel there. Then if I come under shape depth, if I drag this over to the left, it's starting to hug the text a little bit. So around negative 35. And then I'm going to add a couple more segments to this as well. So if I come under display, I can kind of see what I'm doing. I'm going to add lines here. And then I'm just going to up my segment count a little bit just to add a little bit more polys to it. So around eight, you don't want to go too high because it's going to start slowing your machine down. But it looks like eight might be good. So I'm going to go back to my normal shading here under display and zoom back. And it looks like our text is ready to go. It was that easy to chisel it out. And so let me click back on my camera and then in my viewport here, I'm actually going to click on this and then on my keyboard, click H and this actually zooms my camera out to fill up the scene with my text here. So now all I have to do is go into my coordinates on my camera, make the Y back to zero. And I really did that because I wanted it to go back on the Z. Then I could kind of just fine tune it from here, how far back I really want it to be. So I think around negative 1500 is good. And then I'm going to click on my text again. I'm going to drag this down on the Y axis a little bit to its like optical center. So let's see around there, maybe like 45, negative 45, nice round number. So it looks like we're good to go with our text and everything here. So now I'm going to texture it out using some of the mega scans textures. So let me come down and find Quixel bridge. And I actually have the texture that I want to use already saved out in my favorites. So I have Quixel Bridge open. I'm going to come over here to my heart where my favorites are set up at. And I'm actually going to use this one here called Iron. So if I click on this and I can extend this out a little bit, I want to come over to my export settings. Let me scroll down. Make sure I have my texture resolution at a high resolution. I'm going to use 4K. 
I'm gonna use a PNG and I'm gonna export to Cinema 4D. It's very important that you have this set correctly and you have the um, plugin installed. And then remember here in our settings, we have it set to Redshift. If we don't have it set to Redshift, it's not gonna give us a Redshift material. So make sure you have that setting set ahead of time before you export. So from here and Bridge, I'm just gonna click Export. And you can see down here, it already dropped the texture in my window here. It was that fast. So all I have to do is click and drag that over my text now. And there we have our text already textured with the Mega Scans texture. So if I come under my render view and click play, you can see that we have our iron texture on here. I know it's a little bit noisy. We'll fix that in a little bit, but first I want to focus on the lighting and then we'll get to all the noise and everything here. So let me make this a little bit smaller. And I first like to start my lighting off with a HDR map. So if I come under my lighting, come under dome light, it's gonna add a dome light. And if you click under general, we can actually add a HDR here under the path. So if I come under my Adobe bridge, I have a bunch of HDRs that I already had downloaded. If you go to hdrhaven.com, there's a bunch of free ones. This one isn't on there. I'm not sure exactly where I got this one at, but I like using this one a lot. If you want it, just hit me up. I'll send it over to you. But this one gives us some good accents, especially like on our bevels and everything. So I drag that over here and you can already see how it's accenting our text here. So I would come over to my coordinates and I'm actually twist it around a little bit until I get it where I like it on my text. It's getting a little bit distracting seeing it in here. So if I go into general and where it says enable background, I'm gonna turn that off and then just turn on my alpha channel. And that way I can focus here on my text. So I'm gonna go back under my coordinates and just play around with this until I find something that I like how it's shining off the text. Then we're gonna add some lights to this later, but I like just working this part here to get the accents going. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. I think there is good. So now I'm going to add in a spotlight. So I'm going to come back under my lights, come under a spotlight. And I'm going to come over here where my spotlight is in my hierarchy window. Click on tags and under animation tags, I'm going to click on target. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make sure that my spotlight is always looking at my text. So that's why I set up a target because now with this selected, I can select Motex, slap that over here. And now my spotlight's always gonna be facing the direction of my text. So I'm gonna just go up to a quad viewport here and I'm gonna start dragging this back. And you can see as I'm moving it back, it started looking at the text. So no matter where I move it on my viewport, it's always gonna look at my Motex there. And then I'm gonna open up the cone angle a little bit. So I clicked on general. I'm gonna open up the cone angle a little bit here. And we can see what's happening in the text here. So if I move this up to maybe like 100, we're starting to get it hitting on all the sides here. And now I wanna add some color to this as well. So I kinda of wanted to go for like a hot and cold feel. So on my left side, I'm gonna make a red. And then on my right side, I'm gonna hit it with just like a hint of blue. And so I'm gonna hold down control on my keyboard, click and drag, and that's gonna make a duplicate here. So I actually take this duplicate, zoom back on my top view, and just move this all the way over to the left. You can zoom it out like so. And then under color here, I'm gonna change the color to red. So click my RGB, just drag this over to red. I like using the gradient tab here, it's easier to see. Something like that. So now you can see we're getting some red accents on the left side of the text. I'm actually gonna move the light over a little bit more so I get a little bit more of the W there. And I could probably bring up the exposure a little bit as well. There we go. So we're really hitting it with the red over here. Now I want to go on the opposite side and make it blue. So I'm going to do the same thing. Click on this one. Hold down control on my keyboard. Left click drag. And I made a copy of that. And then I'm going to make this one blue. But before I do that, like if you, um, if you want to have like your axis always be left to right and up and down in your top viewport, you can easily come over here where it says coordinate system. If you click that, then it's gonna always have your coordinate system like this. So when you have it the other way, wherever you have your your item, it's always gonna rotate with it. But sometimes if I wanna just like move it over on the opposite end, but have it be at the exact same angle, I like clicking on this 
and then I just click and drag it over to the right like so and then I can pretty much align it pretty well there so that's just a tip that's just something I like to do there and then I'm going to change this color over to blue there we go and then I'm going to take the exposure down to let's say maybe one on this one so I just want to kind of have an accent on the side here so I can actually drag this out a little bit more so I want to have it hit the W as well here so I think this is looking pretty good and so what I want to do now is I actually want to have like a long shadow coming down from my letters and so there's a little trick that I'm going to do I'm going to add a plane here and then I'm going to have a light coming from the top and shining down just to give us the shadows there and we can actually make these lights that I just made here excluded from that plane and I'll show you how to do that now so let me add a plane if I come up here to my shapes come down a plane then on my orientation I'm going to make it Z and I'm just going to drag this out till it fills up the frame and you can see what I'm saying how it's affecting like the light is shining on the plane as well so I can actually make that light not affected so I'm gonna drag out my plane until it's to the back of my text and then if I take and grab all my lights here and then if I come under project you can see we have a tab here that says exclude if I drag my plane under here now it's not affecting the plane at all it's only affecting the text and I want to make the plane black so I'm going to actually make another um, texture here so I'm going to make a material a redshift material just double click on that and then for my color I'm going to go down to black maybe just a little bit of off black there and then I'm going to bring my reflections all the way down maybe just a hint of reflection there actually I'll just bring it all the way down we don't really need it then I'm going to put that on my plane here and there we go so now I have a black plane back there and I can actually use this to bring our shadows into our scene that we can actually composite in After Effects and I'll show you how to do that now so I want to come over to my AOV manager click on that and then if I come down to the bottom here we have a tab here that says shadows so it's as easy as just dragging it over and then in my viewport here in my render view I click on shadows you can actually see what shadows is coming in here so now I'm going to come over and I'm going to left click one of my lights here the one that I just have as a white light and then I'm going to come back for the projects and I'm going to delete that so it's affecting our plane so let me drag this up and then drag it over because I want to have it shooting directly down so I drag this up here so this white right here this actually represents our shadow it's inverted in um, inside of Redshift, and so once we bring it into After Effects, I'll actually show you how to invert it back so that we can get a shadow pass out of it. But for right now, which white hair is representing our shadow, so I just wanted like a nice long shadow there on our text. So I think that looks pretty decent there. And then what I want to do now is I want to be able to cut out my text here whenever I'm in After Effects. So I'm just going to do that with a simple puzzle mat. So again, in my AOV manager, I want to click on puzzle mat and then under my mode here, instead of material ID, I'm going to do object ID and for a red ID, I'm going to make this number one and I only have one thing in the scene. So that's all I need. And then under mode text here, I'm going to go over, let me close these out. I'm going to come under tags. I have my mode text selected. Then I'm gonna come under Redshift tags, come under Redshift object, then come under object ID, click override, click one. And now if I come back over to my render view, come under my puzzle map, you can see now we actually have a mat that we could use to cut this text out in After Effects. So now that I have my scene set up, the next step is to animate the camera. And so I'm going to start by going to the end of my scene here on keyframe or actually frame 72. I'm going to click a keyframe on my Z here and then I'm going to go to the beginning. I'm actually going to just drive this all the way in. Actually, let me hit it on zero and then we'll just kind of pull back from there. So I want to start really close, maybe around 20. I'm going to add another keyframe. So I'm going to just click left click on that. 
so now I have a keyframe. And if I click play, it just does kind of like a boring pullback here. So what I'm gonna do now is come under layout and actually go to my animate tab. You can see here we have our keyframes. And if I come over here on my left hand side where it says F curve mode, click on that and we actually have access to our curves now. So I'm gonna go over to my rightmost curve here. I'm gonna click on the handle here, hold down control shift, left click, and I'm just gonna drag this all the way over. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna give us a big pullback and then it's just gonna kinda of drift back. So let me click play and you can see what it's doing. So it does like a big pull and then it just slowly starts to reveal back. And if I wanna make it more dramatic, I can actually move it over even more. And then if I wanna add maybe like a little build up at the top, I could take the top keyframe, move it over to the right a little bit. You can see how it's affecting it there. So something like that. And that's giving us a pretty epic camera move. And just to save on keyframe rendering in cinema, I'm only gonna do this with 72 frames. And then I'm actually gonna go in and kind of make my, my render tab a little bit higher than HD. And so if I go here, you can actually see exactly what I did. So I'm gonna click on my edit render settings. I did this previously beforehand, but before I had it at 1920 by 1080, here, let me show you. So I have it at 1920 and 1080, but I like rendering at a little bit higher resolution. And that way I can bring it into After Effects and actually give me some um, leeway when it comes to scaling. And so I could do my dramatic camera move here and then just use keyframe scaling and After Effects to add a little bit more drift to it so I can have it for an extended amount of time. And so under my width, I'm just gonna click on 2500 and this is still keeping it at 1920. I mean, um, 16 by nine, sorry. As long as you have the lock ratio button here clicked, and then that will give us the extra resolution that we need to work in our HD frame and um, After Effects. So now that we have our animation all set up, let's look at our render settings and how we're gonna render this out. So under here, I'm using version, um, I think version 3.18018, and that's the one that has the auto sampling. So if I come under system and come under experimental options, you could click on enable auto sampling and that way we don't have to miss with all the sampling and everything under here. And then for my GI, I just did a radiance cache. And I think that was about it for my render settings there. Am I missing anything? No, I think that's about it. So from here, we just wanna save it out to where we wanna save it. I'm gonna do as a open EXR. And then for my multi-pass, I'm just gonna use a simple PNG. And then under my composite project file, just make sure I have everything clicked on here. I'm using After Effects. And so this will save out an AEC file with my render. And there we go. I have some nice clean text. And so I'm gonna render this out and then we're gonna finish it all up in After Effects. Okay, so now we have After Effects open. I took the liberty of adding a couple of files here. This is just some stock footage that I have of like dust and fog that I'm gonna use on my composition here. And so to get started, let me hold down control, hit I on my keyboard. This is gonna bring up the import window. And out of Cinema 4D, this is all the renders that we have. And remember that we set up the file to send out an AEC file from Cinema. So I'm only gonna import this because this is gonna import everything else with it. So if I click on import, now you see it gives us two folders over here. One's just special passes and then the other one's just a regular folder here. So I'm gonna take this and just drag it, consolidate it under one folder. And then it also gives us a comp here as well. And so our comp is 2500 by 1406. Let me zoom down a little bit. And you can see in here, it gives us our puzzle mat and our shadow automatically, like already in our composite window here. But I'm gonna delete the shadow pass for now and just leave in the puzzle mat. Then I'm gonna take my actual render and drag that in here. And then pull this back a little bit so we can see the text. And I'm actually gonna pull it all the way back to the end of the frame here so we can start working with this. And so to get started, let me come under my effects and presets. And then I'm gonna type in set. And then drag over set mat. And then over here where it says use for mat, I'm gonna use my red channel and then take mat from layer. I'm gonna take it from my puzzle mat channel 
And there you go. I can actually go down to my puzzle mat layer, turn this off, add my transparency, and you can see exactly what's going on here. So we added transparency here to our background. And then I'm gonna actually add some fog back there so we can see what we're doing. And the fog, I believe, is at 4K, so it gives us the liberty to bring this down a little bit. And then I don't wanna see that much fog into the scene, so I'm actually gonna right click down here and let's add a solid. And we could do maybe, maybe like a grayish, like black, but not all the way black, so just like a really dark gray. And then I'm gonna drag that under my fog. I'm actually gonna screen the fog over top of that. And then I'm gonna bring down the transparency. So I just hit T on my keyboard to bring up the opacity here. And I can actually drag this down a little bit. Then I can actually add some color to this fog as well. So let's add like a hue. So I'm gonna go back to my effects and presets, click on hue, add like a hue and saturation. I'm just gonna actually let me colorize it. And then somewhere around there, maybe. So just adding a little bit of color to it and kind of heat it up a little bit. Cool, and then now what we're gonna do is, actually, let me go to my text. Just add a little bit of levels to it as well. There you go, something like that. And I can actually turn down the fog a little bit more. Like so. Cool. All right, so now I wanna start adding like some more ding marks and some rust and everything to this text since it's a little bit too perfect here. I know we used the dinged up text for our mega scans, but I wanna ding it up a little bit more because from a distance, it looks a little bit too pristine. So I'm gonna go back to my Quixel bridge let me open that up and then I'm gonna go under my favorites again. I have some stuff saved here that I'm gonna use. So I wanna start by using this rusted middle. And so instead of exporting, you can't export this to um, After Effects, but what I could do is right click on my texture and then go to files. And this will actually bring up all the files that are associated with that texture. So I could bring in the Albedo file into After Effects to start working with that. So I'm gonna just click and drag this maybe under my images folder. Okay, and then let me make a actual composition. I'm gonna leave it at 19, 20, 10, 80. Let's name this one Rust. Um, resolution at full, just click okay. And then I'm gonna grab this texture and drag it in here. And this texture is at 4K, so I can actually bring this down a little bit, try to match like the size of the window here. And I have this other folder here on my left-hand side here called pre-comps. So I'm gonna drag my Rust composition under pre-comps just to kind of organize my scene here. Click save, here we go. So now what I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna add a turbulence to this and then um, kind of just use a little bit of the rest here to punch through onto our text. So I'm gonna right click down here. I'm gonna make a black solid, make this one fully black. And you'll see exactly what I'm gonna do here. So now I'm gonna come over and under my effects and presets, click on turbulence, and I'm gonna use turbulent noise. Okay, so from here, now under my fractal type, I'm gonna make a, a turbulent sharp. And I have my settings written down here, I believe. Let me see, what did I use? So I use sharp, and then for my noise type, I use linear. And then for my contrast, drag this up. Something like that, maybe like 220. And then my brightness, I'm gonna bring this down a little bit. Cause we're gonna use this to actually punch through the rest too. So for my transform, actually let me show you now. So I'm gonna click on my rest tag here and I'm gonna come over to track mat and then I'm gonna do a luma mat. Let me click on transparency and you can see exactly what we're doing now. So I'm actually using the turbulence noise to add like a little bit of, um, I guess, chaos to this. So it's not just 
a plain texture that we're putting over top of our texture. So let me come back over to my turbulence noise, come down to my scale. I'm gonna shrink this down a lot, maybe down to like 50, something like that. And then actually let me drag down my brightness a little bit more because we don't want too much, just enough to kind of add a little bit of detail to our text. So I'm gonna go back to my main composition. I'm gonna come over, drag my rest under here over top of my text. And then I'm gonna use that puzzle mat. I'm just gonna copy it and click paste. Actually, no, that's not gonna work because that's not the same size. So I'm actually just gonna duplicate this text, bring it up above my rest, and then I'm just gonna use the alpha channel from there like so. And now we have rest on our text here. So I'm going to color coordinate these a little bit so I know what goes with what. So I'll make that purple there. Then I'm just going to make my original text dark green. Make the rest of these red. And in the camera, I'm just going to make none. So, because I'm going to add a couple of more layers on top of this. So for my rest, I could probably even knock down the transparency a little bit. So we're just adding a little bit of detail to it. Okay, so now that we have the rest on our text, now I wanna add some ding marks. So I'm gonna go back to Quixel Bridge, go down here like so. And then this one here called Scratch Paint Middle. I'm gonna right click, go to Files. And let's see which one, we have a masked version here. So let's use this. I'm gonna click and drag this over here to my hierarchy window. And then let's make another composition. So I'm gonna just name this one Scratched Middle. There we go, leave it at 1920, click OK. And then I'm gonna take that file that I just had, drag that into my composition. And actually, if I click S on my keyboard, bring up the scale. If I right click on scale, come down to edit value, I can actually make it 100% width because I know that's what we wanna, um, I wanna bring it in as close as possible to our composition source here. So if I click on units, go to percentage of composition, you can see now I can click on width, click 100. And if I click OK, now you can see that our texture is taking up 100% of the width of our composition here. And so now what I'm going to do is hit Control D, duplicate this. Then I'm actually going to come over to Effects and Presets, click on Invert, drag over to Invert, and then I'm going to make a, a Luma Mat based off of that Invert. So I'm actually using the texture to punch the alpha channel out of itself. So let me click on this, then click on this toggle here for my transparency. And you can actually see we punched out an alpha channel with its own texture here. And so I'm gonna come over to my original composition here. And actually let me, um, I'm gonna make this Rust a 3D file first before I do anything because we do have camera information here that we brought in from Cinema 4D. And so I'm gonna click on this make it a 3D file. And then I'm actually going to drag it back over to the center here. And this is why I like working in the center of Cinema 4D whenever I start my projects, because usually I can align everything back in After Effects the same way. I'm gonna click S on my keyboard. And I'm just gonna scale it down to it fits my text again, like so. And then I'm gonna duplicate these layers. So I'm gonna select these two, hit Control D, duplicate those. I'm gonna make this orange just for organization's sake. Click on my rest panel here, and then come up to my composition that I just made called Scratch Middle. If I hold down the left Alt key on my keyboard, click and drag that over my rest layer here, it's actually going to replace it. So now we have those potch marks all over our text but it's not looking like it's actually engraved into our text. And so what we need to do is add like a, a bevel emboss. And I'm gonna show you the incorrect way to do it. Then I'm gonna show you the correct way because the first instinct would be to just click on my layer here, come down to our, um, our layer styles, and then click on bevel and emboss. And that's how you normally would do it. But for some reason, when it's a 3D layer, it doesn't let us use the alpha channel. It doesn't let us use track mats or anything like that. And so an easy fix is, I'm gonna control Z on that. I'm gonna just go into the original composition. 
and go to my layer here and add my emboss here. So I'm gonna go to my layer styles, bevel and emboss, and then I'm just gonna set up my settings here. So let me come down to my level one or my bevel and emboss. I'm gonna make this a chisel hard. We're gonna go for direction down because we wanna make it look like an indent. So you can already see it's looking like it's pushing in right there. Then let me move my size up maybe to like eight. And then I'm gonna go back into my original composition. And you can see now it looks like our, our um, scratch paint there is actually indented into our texture, which is really cool. And now if I go through my timeline, you can see that it actually travels with my text. So it's sticking 100% to it. And when we add some motion blur, it's actually gonna make it look really good, but yeah, it's sticking with it and everything. So if we wanna make it look like it's punched in a little bit more, we could actually raise up the size a little bit more. There we go. And then we're gonna do the same thing again. We're gonna add like a bunch of little embossed marks on here just to kind of ding it up a little bit more. So let me come back to my Quicksilver Bridge. I'm gonna go over to this one that's called Stone. Right click, go to Files. Let me see what I have to work with. I'll use this 4K gloss. So I'm gonna just come over here, drag this in here. And actually, let me bring this under pre comps. And then I'm gonna drag these under textures, or actually under images. Then I'm gonna make another pre comp. Let me just name this one stone. Then I'm gonna grab that stone texture that I just made, drag that in here. Then I'm gonna click Control D, duplicate it. And then I'm gonna add some levels to it. So let's bring these levels up because we're gonna use this to make a alpha mat out of itself as well. So somewhere around there. And then let me do my track mat, Luma mat. Actually for this one, I have to do Luma invert. There you go like that. And I could probably have it be a little bit less detailed. So I'm gonna come back to my levels, drag them over a little bit more like that. Let me go back to my original composition. I'm gonna take my scratch metal layer in the alpha right there. Control D make this one blue the same concept as before i'm going to take this composition hold down the left alt key drag it down and now we have it replaced on there so you can see it added on top of our text and then we're going to do the same thing with the bevel here so bevel and emboss come down let's make it chisel hard click it on direction down and then bring our size up a little bit and then go back and now it looks like it's indenting our texture so now we have some dinged up text and if i want to make it a little bit more all you have to do is come back here let's drag your levels over to the right and i just want to kind of show you guys the kind of flexibility you have so now it's really eating up our text there. So if you wanted to actually animate that to kind of make it look like it's eating up the text as it's moving um, backwards, kind of like it's degrading, then you can actually just animate your levels here. But I'm just gonna leave it as is. Drag this over like so. So now we have our text that if I hit zero, and everything is lining up. So we have our ding text. It's zooming backwards like so. And we'll add some motion blur and everything. If you have real smart motion blur, that helps out. So hopefully this helped you guys out. If there's any techniques that could kind of help you guys out in there, make that cinematic text, please let me know in the comment down below. And on April 21st, make sure you check out C4D Live. I'm going to be doing a live presentation from Axon going into in-depth like how to use Cinema 4D with Unreal. So that's something that you don't want to miss out on. So until next time, stay fresh, keep creating, and I'll catch you in the next video. Take care.